Praise God. Good morning, everybody. Okay. So, um, like I said earlier, we're going to be going into three sets of scriptures that are not going to be on slides. <clears throat> so, if you want, actually, I want everyone to hold their Bible up. Okay. I want to make sure everyone has a Bible. Wanda, lift up your Bible. Karen, got a Bible? Sari's got a Bible. Everyone got your Bible? All right. So the first thing you want to do is, if you're in a pew Bible, it's going to be on page 676, Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. That is not our main scripture today, but it is still very, very key <laughs> to what is going on here today. The second set of scriptures are our main verses. That's Mark 12. That's page 1008, as Deacon Ken just told you. And the third one's relatively easy. It's all the way in the back of your Bible. It's Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Praise God. Well, you know, what I endeavor to do, I've, I've really come... A long way since I started preaching the gospel and, and pre preaching from a pulpit. And, uh, you know, I used to be very into topical sermons. And there's nothing wrong with a topical sermon as long as you preach it expositionally. Expositorily. That means verse by verse. You stay in the context of what it's telling you and you don't try to add to it. And uh, I've been to many churches in my life and churches where I've said I've seen and heard uh, the Bible preached correctly and um, exposited correctly. And it was brought back to my attention this past week in listening to the various sermons and, and programs I listened to. What the goal is of me and of you in your life and me in my ministry in life from the pulpit. And that is from Matthew 28 where Jesus gives out the Great Commission. And he says, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. All right, so my job as a pastor is to make disciples out of you. You see, and I can't make a disciple out of you unless you come to church. And I can't make a disciple out of you unless you come to prayer. And I can't make a disciple out of you unless you come to Bible study. Sure, you'll learn if you come one day a week or one and a half or but it's not really, you know, what we have afforded everyone to grow and to learn what it means to be a Christian and what it means to grow in Christ, all right? So, um, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, which we do. Here's the kicker. Teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. All that what, who commanded them? All that Jesus commanded them. So if I'm going to be true to this scripture, then what I'm going to talk to you about will always come back to Jesus and his teachings. Right? When uh, Jesus was rebuking the Pharisees one time, he said, you search the scriptures and you don't realize, I'm paraphrasing, you don't realize that they're about me. You see? So when I'm, whether I'm preaching in the New Testament or the Old Testament, I should be sharing, I should be bringing it always back to Jesus. If I'm going to do justice to the call that's been placed on my life. It's not about self-help sermons. It's not about motivational speeches. If it's not about Jesus. And so that is what I am endeavoring to do here. So with that in mind, we're going to be turning to Mark chapter 12, page 1008 in your pew Bible. Father God, I come before you today once again, Lord, humbled um, that a wretch like me could be given the uh, honor and blessing of preaching your word from the pulpit, Lord God. And um, although I know I'm not worthy, Lord, I endeavor to um, bring honor to you in my call as I pray everybody here, whether you're online, good morning, Facebook and Zoom, um, are endeavoring to do in their lives day by day, minute by minute, moment by moment, Lord God, bringing glory to you, Father. May you be lifted high today, Lord, because if it wasn't for you, we'd all be going to hell. Thank you, Lord. 
Okay, so today we're going to, as I shared last week, um, Jesus was speaking to the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders in the temple. He had just, the day before, made a whip with his disciples present and drove everybody out. Right? They went pat on their way, and then they left. And they left Jerusalem, and they walked past the fig tree. And what happened to the fig tree? He had cursed it on their way there because it didn't bear any fruit. Representative of Israel, of the leadership of Israel, and, and corporate Israel trickles on down, doesn't it? As the head goes, so the body will follow, right? Day goes past, next day comes, they come walking by the fig tree, and it's dead. And they're all amazed. But Jesus was making a point. This, this thing that it had become, Israel, will not be revived in its previous form, right? There will be a spiritual Israel. And that and she, right, the bride will bear fruit. And so we're going to talk a little bit more about fruit today. Because now Jesus goes back to the temple. And we, I started really talking about this last week. This is really kind of a part two contextually. Because now we're talking about Jesus confronting the leadership of Israel. Chief priests, scribes, elders. All right? Now, I say that and, and saying that I, he's addressing them. He's by extension addressing all of Israel as the fig tree so beautifully illustrates. But really, even by extension, extension, he's addressing uh, those in leadership in his church today. Because, don't, hey, don't be fooled. Just because you say you're a Christian doesn't mean Satan went away and doesn't seek to veer people off of the path, get people into false doctrine, move people away from the truth of the scriptures into something perverted. Some bastardized form which doesn't save. We see pictures of that all around us in false gospels. Two examples, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses. They're not Christian. Their gospel is not our gospel. I know this might be a little offensive, but Roman Catholic Church, same thing. Their gospel is not our gospel. Their Jesus is not our Jesus. Doesn't mean you need to hate them. Doesn't mean you need to scorn them. It means they need to hear the true gospel. Because they think they have it. All three of them think they have it. So Jesus is addressing these leaders. And, um, and now, at this point, this week, he now speaks to them in a parable. Now, earlier in the Gospel of Mark, we, we, when he started talking to them in parables, uh, he said that, you know, the reason why he gives parables is that hearing they might not hear, seeing they might not see. In other words, the, the, one of the main functions of a parable is really to separate the wheat from the chaff. Because many times when he gives parables previously, you see after he says the parables that people leave. That's his intention. And then he, he, those who are chosen, those who are called and chosen and stay, he then clarifies it and makes a teaching out of it. Well, that's not the case here today. Here today, Jesus is going to give them a parable, but he's going to um, uh, mimic the Old Testament. So that they know perfectly well what it is he's talking about. And it's indicated at the end of this set of scriptures in verse 12 where it says, And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. But why don't we hear what he has to say? Mark chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And he, Jesus, began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the winepress and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. And they took him and beat him and sent him away empty handed. Again, he sent to them another servant and they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent another and him they killed. 
And so with many others, some they beat and some they killed. He had still one another. Uh, he had still one other. Lost my place. A beloved son. Finally, he sent to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. What will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. Have you not read in this scripture? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. So they left him and went away. So now what I want you to do is go to Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. shouldn't take too long. I already gave you the page if you have a pew Bible. The prophet Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. Does anyone have that in the pew Bible? You can say the page one more time. Bam, 676. Isaiah chapter 5 verses 1 through 7. All right, now this is the parable that Jesus is, uh, the, the uh, scripture that Jesus is referring to in saying this parable to this, these leaders. And he wants them to know he's talking about them. So he uses a parable. He draws from uh, another scripture in the Old Testament that they know and that they know relates to the leaders of Israel and Israel in general. Here we go. Isaiah chapter 5 1 through 7. Let me sing for my beloved my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a, very, had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it and cleared it of stones and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for it to yield grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. I'm going to stop there for a second. Wild grapes were sour and bitter and could not be used for its purpose, which is wine. Okay. And now, O oh, inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I have not done in it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? And now I tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedges, its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. I will make it a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed, and briars and thorns shall grow up. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. Now, in that set of scriptures, the bloodshed and the outcry, you know what he's talking about? The prophets who they stoned and killed. All right? And in an extended sense, yes, the Messiah. Go to slide three, please. So in verse one, he begins to speak to them in parables, and he just drives it right home using the exact same symbology in what he says in verse 1. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it, that's a hedge, and put a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. So it's not that God left, but God entrusted the oracles to the leadership of Jerusalem. He entrusted uh, the Pentateuch to Israel, to the, the scribes, chief priests, and elders, to cultivate the kingdom of God on earth. That's the vineyard. Israel was the people of God. They, for all intents and purposes, represented the kingdom of God on earth. But rather than cultivating them properly, they perverted and bastardized what it was that, that Judaism was all about and produced wild grapes. And if you, if you remember what we just read from Isaiah, it's a permanent judgment he gives to them. 
I will destroy it. I won't give rain. It's going to be utterly destroyed. And I think of a fig tree. It's just another picture. They walk by. He says, never again will you bear fruit. He doesn't say later on there's going to be uh, Jews that come to Christ. We're going to call it the Messianic Church. And they're going to be the true model of what it is to be a Christian. He doesn't say that. He is going to take a people. They can be Jews. They can be Gentiles. And make them spiritual Israel. Now, there was some spiritual Israel in the Old Testament. Some people were saved. I mean, read Hebrews chapter 12 and you will see the roll call of God. Just giving it from the Bible, a people in the Bible who were faithful to God and were born again, really, redeemed. On the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus is visited by Moses and Elijah. Well, he didn't call them up from hell to make this appearance. He's the God of the living, isn't, is he not? So when you die, I know it's going to be scary for you. I I know it's going to be unexpected. But you're not dying. You're living. (laughs) You see, that's the fallacy we need to get out of our heads. If I live, it's Christ. If I die, it's gain. Amen. So he uses Isaiah 5, 1 through 2 as the basis for this imagery for this parable that we just read from the Gospel of Mark. And the vineyard is a common symbol for the Jewish nation in Scripture. So here, God has several characters. All right? First, you have a man who plants a vineyard. That's God. Right? Now, this is all from chapter 12 of Mark. The vineyard is Israel. In a larger sense, it's the kingdom of God on earth, his people. They are his, and he is willing for them to bear good fruit. And, and here's what's beautiful about it. You know, this good fruit that's born, first and foremost, it brings glory to God, right? It's one of our main purposes in creation, being created. We're to bring glory to God. The second is to be a product that can be consumed by others. And is beneficial. I I think of Paul telling Timothy to take some wine for his many stomach ailments. It's medicinal. Now I'm not telling you to go out and get drunk. Uh, It's not the point here. It's not what I'm saying. The fruit is a people who are his. Good fruit. Not wild grapes. True grapes. His disciples given over to the Lord in humility and devotion. And, the, and these people are referred to in Isaiah as the negative wild grapes. A fruit that did not, he, he didn't intend to be grown. It, he can't use it. It's good for nothing but to be destroyed. And wild grapes were bitter and sour. The fence meant for protection, the hedge, protection from intruders. Well, Israel became a den of wolves, didn't it? A pit to catch the juice of the crushed grapes, to catch the fruit of the labors, that good fruits product. Um, The pit represents, you know, they, they, they crush the grapes, and then the juice would flow out of it. That's called sanctification. That's you being conformed to the image of Christ. That's trials, tribulations, uh, crushings, right? Crushed grapes. It's another, another picture is the fuller's soap, an acidic soap that was used to clean uh, laundry. And I'm not talking about Tide in your washing machine. I'm talking about the old, you know, washboard and you put the clothes on it, you take the soap and you go. Wine press. <clears throat> the tower had a threefold purpose. The tower was meant to serve as a lookout post for intruders. It provided shelter for the, co- uh, for the workers in, inside of it. And it was used for storage of seed and tools. And finally, the tenants are the Jewish leadership. They are the tenants. 
the chief priests, the scribes and elders of Israel. They were entrusted by the owner to take good care of the vineyard and cultivate it. To assist it in bearing good fruit. From this fruit was expected payment from the first fruits to be made to the Lord. And you know what's interesting? You're right, Rich. His giving this parable to the leadership then in Mark 12 is basically saying that the Isaiah story is referring to them. They who have killed the prophets, including John the Baptist, Old Testament prophet in the New Testament, and ultimately Christ. Slide number four, please. So when the season came, he sent a servant to the tenants to get from them some of the fruit from the vineyard. God sent prophets. They are servants. The Greek word for servants is doulon, which is where we get the word doulos, which is a slave. In this sense, it's a bond servant. It's not somebody who's been enslaved on, uh, under compulsion and force, but somebody who's willingly submitted to their master to go about a work for the master. And that's what the prophets did. They would come to Israel. God sent them. They would call them to repentance, much like we did this morning before church. But they would go further and, and speak of their losing their place. They're being conquered in exile, taken out of the promised land, which is ultimately what happened, is not. They were exiled throughout the whole world. You had two exiles in the, New Test in the Old Testament. You have the Assyrian exile, and then you have the Babylonian exile. And finally, in the New Testament, you have, it's not called this, but you might as well be the Roman exile. In AD 70, Rome sacks Israel. And all the Jews, probably not all, but the vast majority of Jews were spread throughout the planet Earth. And that's what makes the state of Israel being made a state so prophetically significant for the end times. Because when that happened, when Israel was granted statehood, they started returning to their land, which is one of the prophecies of the Old Testament about the Messiah's return. Slide number five, please. So they took him and they beat him and they sent him away empty-handed. Prophets. And he sent to him another prophet, another servant. And they struck him on the head and treated him shamefully. And he sent yet another prophet. And him they killed. And so many with, uh, and, and so with many others. Some they beat, some they killed. God sent the prophets to the people. They taught people. They warned the people. So that maybe some might repent and follow the Lord. Isn't that what we do today when we proclaim the gospel? And I mean, you know, I've done open air preaching. I, you know, so I, I've done like what the prophets did literally. But you, when you share your faith with somebody, you're doing the exact same thing. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. You're calling people who are off the mark and calling them to get back on the mark. And they either respond or they don't. Well, they, they do respond either way, don't they? And really what they're doing when they say no is they're taking the son and throwing him out of the vineyard and they're saying, hey, let's, let's take this over. We can be the heir. In other words, I'm the God of my life. Thank you very much. And, and, you know, God might be, you know, your word, the Bi your book, they'll say to you. You know, the Bible, or it may say that God is the creator of all people, but I'm going to be my own God. Thank you very much. I'm going to be the heir of the kingdom. The prophets were sent to the Jews, God's people. While there have always been some who have been true to the Lord, Israel went astray and did not bear fruit. Instead, he held God, they held God in contempt, beating and killing the messengers. They wanted to do things in their own way. And they saw fit, as they saw fit, and to satisfy their own lusts. 
And, you know, we're reading this in the context of Israel in the Old Testament, but isn't that the way of a people who eat fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? So doesn't this apply to more than just Israel? It does. Slide number six, please. So he had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them saying, they will respect my son. Two things here. In the Greek, you see the word finally he sent them? In other words, he didn't go, you know what? Enough sending other people. I'm going to send one of my sons. Finally. In other words, lastly. That's what the Greek means. In other words, there is no other after Jesus. I am sorry if you're a Muslim. Muhammad was not sent of God. Buddha was not sent of God. Krishna was not sent of God. Anton LaVey, if you're a Satanist, not sent of God. Obviously, they'll, they'll agree. There is no other savior. There is no other final prophet. God sent his only begotten son. There is no other heir to send. That's the first thing. He is the son of the owner of the vineyard. And that tells me that God is a persevering God, that he continued to do this even to send his own representative of his blood, right? He could have stopped after the prophets or at any time during that, as he said to Moses, I'm going to destroy these people and I'll make another people from you. And Moses intercedes for Israel and goes, Lord, please don't do that. The, the whole world will mock you if you wipe out all your people. And God repented. Moses was standing as a uh, symbol of Christ in that moment. So what God does is he sent the second person of the triune Godhead, Jesus. That the Jews, represented by their leaders, would both recognize the Son of God and respect him as the heir of the kingdom. They will respect my son. That word means reverence in the Greek. Lastly, so if I'm going to be literal in Greek, lastly, he sent his only son to him. That's what beloved means. Um, a beloved son means an only begotten. That's where they get that in the King James Version. Lastly, he sent him to them saying, they will reverence my son. Revere, awe, worship. Well, that's not exactly what happened, is it? Slide seven. Those tenants said to one another, look, this is the heir. Let us kill him and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Now, the wording of this verse, and I, I, I never saw this. This isn't like a big wow thing, but it is. They thought God was dead. They thought the owner of the vineyard was dead. See, if they kill the heir and the owner's still alive, they're not going to get possession of the vineyard, are they? They're assuming that the owner died, right? Because he's been away for so long. He must have died because look, he's sending his son. He's the heir. Now, if the son gets killed and he's the only son, who else is going to get the vineyard? The tenants. The tenants. If we kill the heir, there will be no family to take possession, and thus we will become the heirs. But though they tried, they were unable to. You see, in, in the crucifixion, they saw a victory, right? Israel saw a victory. The leaders, those representative of the whole, saw victory. Satan saw victory. And in that supposed loss, God took victory out of their hands. And brought judgment at the same time, didn't he? And just because it's delayed with the people of the world today. He's going to do it again, folks. He's going to come back. 
And all those people who thought they had inherited their life for themselves to live as they please will see that there is a conquering king. There is a lion of Judah. And he will come and he will bring his justice and his righteousness and his judgment. To steal the inheritance is to say that you are God. That you are in charge and that there is no Lord other than you. It's basically the same sin as Lucifer, as Satan. When he said in Isaiah 14, 13, slide number 8. I will ascend, this is, Satan, this is Lucifer, the, the head angel in heaven. God's number two. Right? Well, number four, Father, Son, Spirit. All right? I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. These are called the five I wills. Of Satan. And so these tenants take the sun. You know, the, the, the earth is the Lord's and all that is on it. We are tenants. I don't care if you're saved or not. Christian, Muslim, you have the same responsibilities, these tenants. And you see in every person individually what they have made of that. Most can't even recognize it. They just assume what Satan assumed. They're on the throne. And so the tenants take the son. They kill him. And they throw him out of the vineyard. So the truth of what Judaism should have been is dispensed of. For what these leaders have desired to make of it. For a multitude of reasons. All corrupt. And isn't that the same thing we do on the earth today? He is the savior of the world, folks. Proof that you know we're all made in God's image. Therefore, he provided one savior. Slide nine, please. <clears throat> so what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. The exact same end in Mark, even if it's worded differently in Isaiah. He's not going to come and, you know, trample the vineyard down and then replant and rewater and, you know, no. That's not what's going to happen. He's not going to have the fig tree... Go dormant to be resurrected at a later time and start bearing good fruit again. No. He is called a bride. He is called a spiritual Israel. He has grafted in what was once just for the Jew, only for a season. God knew all along. It was always part of his plan. He grafted, he removed them and then grafted in a new people. Now, what that means is he grafted in everyone. In other words, anyone can be spiritual Israel. It doesn't, um, it doesn't mean is a Jew cannot be saved. It just means that you come to faith in God through Christ. The way to get grace through faith is through faith in Messiah, Jesus This was, oh, have you not read this scripture, verse 10? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Jesus, obviously. What's, what's a, sto a cornerstone? A cornerstone is something that everything else built after it depends on it. All right? Um, a lot of times in the Bible, it's described as in arches, the keystone is the top stone. And from it, 
all the other stones are placed. And if you remove the keystone, it all falls in. Same concept on the cornerstone. The cornerstone makes sure, makes sure that the building has 90 degree angles on the corners so that as it expands out, it moves in the right direction so that when it gets to the next corner and the next corner, they can be 90 degrees as well and join at 90 degrees at the final corner. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The builders, Israel, the leaders, decided to use a different kind of stone. The stone of will, of free will, of choice, and idolatry in making themselves the height of Judaism. Another God. A perverted concept of Messiah. Right? Because all the Jews thought Jesus was, if he was Messiah, he was going to conquer Rome and instill a Jewish kingdom. And the proof he wasn't the Messiah was hanging on a cross. They misinterpreted their own scriptures or perverted them. So the owner of the vineyard will execute the tenants. And the reason why it was God's doing that the stone the builders rejected became the cornerstone was because that rejection allowed God to do something amazing and marvelous. Make it possible for each one of you to become citizens of the kingdom of God. Amen? So it's marvelous in our eyes that he, that they rejected Messiah is my benefit. That doesn't mean I'm to gloat over the Jew or to condescend to the Jew. I, 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 res- I love Israel. I respect Israel. I want to see Israel saved. Because they went through something heinous so that I could have a chance. It was all part of God's plan. So my heart is to see Israel saved. So this parable was an immediate historical prophecy. Mark 1 through 12. In two ways. First, it was fulfilled in the establishment of Christ's church and its leaders. Now, they were all Jews. But very quickly in in terms of time, in terms of the over 2,000 years since Christ... It relatively quickly became a church led by Gentiles, non-Jews. And for all intents and purposes, became a Gentile church. Second, in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 by the Romans and the dispersion of the nation of Israel to all parts of the world. This messianic prophecy quoted from uh, verses 10 and 11 that we just read, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing and is marvelous in our eyes. Comes from Psalm 118, verses 22 and 23. Here in Mark, as in Psalm 118, the text serves as a warning. Jesus is warning these guys. And he's making it clear in a parable to them. That God will reverse man's judgment regarding the Christ. What is man's judgment regarding the Christ? He died. We won. And instead, he makes that the victory. Through him, the whole world gains access to the Messiah. Through his resurrection, that group, the chosen, the elect, will rise again into eternal life. But listen. That doesn't mean that the unchosen won't also rise again. They will rise again. He turned defeat of the, the defeat of the cross into a triumph. Christ would become the cornerstone of the vineyard. The Israel of God, God's kingdom, would be compromised of Jew and Gentile who receive Messiah. Who repent and believe. And folks, 
Many will say to the Lord on that day, Lord, Lord, did not, didn't we do wonderful works in your name? Didn't we do healings? Didn't we this and do that in the name of Jesus? And he will look at them and say, I don't know you. Go to the place that I have prepared for you since the beginning of time. It's called the lake of fire. So a simple profession of faith in Christ. Anybody can say, Christ save me. Even the demons believe and shudder. We even see it in the, in the New Testament, in the Gospels, when Jesus encounters demons and possessing people. They go, we know who you are, the one son of God. Please do not do to us now before the time. In rejecting Christ, Israel was rejecting the Father. And outside of repentance and belief, face both an immediate judgment, which I just spoke about. All right, the Jews being removed from the root and the Gentiles placed in and all the world having access. And the sacking of Rome in AD 70. But there's also an eternal judgment. And in a wider sense, this parable is showing us a person's desire to be left alone so they can rule themselves. To be their own God. This has always been the same sin. Pride, um, as, I, as I posted in the five I wills of Satan, it's, it's what every unbeliever says in one form or another. I will, I will, I will. I do not need a God. I don't want a God. Just leave me alone. I will ascend to the throne of the most high me. Wanting to be the captains of our own lives and fate. In this way, it is no different than Lucifer's sin. And so we can see the similarities in their judgments as well. For both immediate and eternal judgment. For Israel, the immediate judgment, captivity, Right? Assyrian captivity, Babylonian captivity, and then the Rome dispersion. Bondage, servitude, and exile to foreign nations. Now, can I apply that to the church today, to people today? Absolutely. Prophetically, all who indulge in disobedience, the bondage of captivity to various sins, let's just call that addiction. Pick your poison. Various sins and hardships causing bondage and captivity to the world and its prince, who is Satan. Externally, now we're going to go to Revelation chapter 20. Please open up your word to that page. Revelation 20. Revelation 20, we're going to go to verse 7. Verse 7, Revelation 20, verse 7 to 15. This is now taking place after the millennium, after the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, which is yet to come. When the thousand years come to an end, Satan will be let out of his prison. He will go out to deceive the nations called Gog and Magog in every corner of the earth. He will gather them together for battle, a mighty army as numberless as the sand along the seashore. And I saw them as they went up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded God's people and the beloved city. But fire from heaven came down on the attacking armies and consumed them. Then the devil, who had deceived them, was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. The beast is the Antichrist, by the way. They, there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Is Satan destroyed? He's going to be punished, isn't he? For how long? Okay. And I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. The earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. 
I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne. And the books were opened, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in the books. The sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead. And all were judged according to their deeds. Then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire. This lake of fire is the second death. Are you going to be thrown in the lake of fire? No. no. So are you going to experience a second death? No. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the Lamb's book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Is that eternal or temporary? If you will live forever, they will die forever. That is the way of God. I have no right to judge him. I have no right to question him. And the word makes it clear that when I am with him and I am fully perfected in him, that I will have every tear wiped away from my face about those who I love who are in the lake of fire. And I will understand God's righteousness, his holiness, and his prerogative to do as he wishes. Why? Because he is sovereign and he is preeminent. He is above all things and all powerful and right. So I said it last week in my sermon, I'll say it again, because this point needs to be emphasized. Wouldn't it be easier if all the unsaved had to look forward to was a death that ends them? That's it. No more. They just cease to be. Many atheists, though, already believe in this. So that can't be it. Know this, the exile of the unbelievers from the kingdom of heaven described as that exile is described as destruction, will be eternal. Just as it means in eternal life you will never die, in eternal death a person will never die as well. Now, this next set of verses, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, you can pull that up, slide 11. And the one that comes after it, which is from Isaiah 8, I'm taking from the New Living Translation. And what you need to know is that the New Living Translation is pretty much a paraphrase. But... It's close enough to exactly what the word of God is saying that I feel very comfortable giving this to you today in this version so that you'll have a, a better understanding of what's being said to you. Okay? You, you, all our pew Bibles are ESV, so you can compare if you'd like. You'll see they're saying the exact same thing, but making it clear to you in the New Living Translation. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9 tell us this. He, Christ, will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who don't know God and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. And for this reason, James 2.19 tells us that even the demons believe and tremble. The word tremble means bristle, shudder, <sighs> chills. They know. And they do this all in fear of the one God who will judge them with eternal destruction. One which never ends. Slide 12 from Isaiah 8, 13 to 15. New Living Translation. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Church, make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. Make the Lord of heaven's armies holy in your life. I plead with you today. I plead with me today. He is the one you should fear. He is the one who should make you tremble. He will keep you safe. But to Israel and Judah, he will be a stone that makes people stumble, a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Many will stumble and fall, never to rise again. Why? Because Christ is that stone of stumbling. They will be snared and they will be captured. So we see Jesus speaking this prophecy spoken to hundreds, um, spoken hundreds of years ago to the leaders of Israel through Isaiah, 
in those two sets of verses we read earlier, and to the current leaders of Israel in Mark, and to all of Israel, all peoples everywhere in Mark, Jesus Messiah can be your sanctuary, or he can be your stumbling stone into hell. Now, I, I want to, and I'm going to, in just a moment, address it. But if what I am saying to you, and, you know, oh, this guy's preaching on fearing God, and God shouldn't, you know, he's my Lord. I love him. He's my bridegroom. I shouldn't have to fear him. I want you to know that you misunderstand Scripture, and you misunderstand the Word of God. Because fearing the Lord is a foundation of salvation. And we'll get to that in just a moment. I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures. And I'm going to explain why. I don't fear God like Freddy Krueger is going to come at me with this, this, you know, I don't fear him about that. I fear him because I know that's going to be the fate of many people. And outside of his gift of faith to me and his gift of grace and salvation, I, I was one of them. It's, I didn't get that because I merited it. He gave it to me as a gift. He chose me and he chose you. So Jesus speaks this prophecy from Isaiah 8. And uh, they get the point. They know from what Jesus says in the, the parable in Mark 12, they know he's talking about them. They know, because they know Isaiah 5 and they know Isaiah 8, they know what he's saying. They'll be damned. Slide 13. So the people were seeking to arrest him. Uh, and they were seeking to arrest him. At this point in time, the Pharisees, these leaders, the scribes, the chief priests, and the elders, they just want, they want to arrest him. They want to get him out of the public spotlight. And ultimately, they want him dead. Because he is going to bring Rome down on them. Because the more ruckus he causes, the more Rome watches and at some point will say, enough, squash these people. And ultimately, in AD 70, that's exactly what happens. And it's, uh, you should read about it. Look up what happened to Israel in AD 70. They had to eat their children. The Roman army split open women's wombs, took the babies out, and threw them over the well, uh, wall, and then threw them over the wall. I mean, you've never, uh, exactly, thank you, can't imagine. So they left him and went away. Now, what do you mean they left him and went away? Well, if you were here last week, you'll recall Jesus asked them a question. Was the baptism of John from God or from man? And they said, well, if we say it's from man, they're going to be mad at us because they believe John was sent of God. And if we say he was from God, they'll say, well, how come you didn't listen to him? And they'll be mad at them again. So they took the easy way out. They boogied. They didn't answer, and they left. And Jesus said, well, I won't answer you either. Because verily, Christ and John the Baptist were sent by the same person, the Father. But the chief priests, scribes, and elders feared people more than they feared God, didn't they? I mean, they killed God. They crucified him. Second person of the triune Godhead. So what does the Bible have to tell us? I'm only giving you two verses. There's many more. But regarding fear and the fear of God. Slide 14, please. Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Only a fool will say they don't have to fear God in any sense of the word. Only a fool. It's the basis of our respect and awe for him. It's, he's not saying you must live in terror the rest of your eternity. The whole reason Israel apostatized was because they did not fear God. The whole reason they're ending up out of the root is because they didn't fear God. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So the fear, a biblical fear of the Lord will, is the beginning of your having knowledge about who God is and what he wants. And it's wisdom and instruction. 
and insight. I would go so far as to say there was no fear of God in these leaders at all. So here's, here's what the challenge. If you fear a heart attack, go to the doctor and he says, listen, your, your arteries, you're going you're gonna to get out. You're going to die, man. You're going to have a heart attack. What do you do? What do you do? Exercise. You eat well, right? If you fear your home will get burglarized, what will you do? Get an alarm system, maybe buy a gun, right? You will take steps to protect you from the negative influence and impact of those things. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge. If I fear the Lord, I am going to take steps to be safe from the negative impact of having a righteous, holy God come to my presence. And what is that action? What is that thing? Repent and believe. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Turn back to the Lord. Live for him. Walk towards the the cross of Christ. Um, We're in Bible study. We're doing Genesis 24. We just finished it. Well, now we're starting Genesis 25 this next week. But we're talking about how the servant takes Rebecca. He puts her on a camel. Representative of the Ten Commandments, there were ten camels. The Ten Commandments show you that you're in trouble with God. Because they are a statement of his perfection and your imperfection. They're a statement of God's just righteousness to condemn you to hell. Every single one of us. They get on the camels, the bride, and the servant, representative of the Holy Spirit, takes them where? He leads them to Christ. Humility. Knowing of what you deserve, knowing of what he did for you, should draw you closer and closer to your God. Amen? What does that look like? It looks like prayer. It looks like studying the word of God. It looks like associating with the body of Christ. It looks like sharing your faith with others. It looks like many different things. Slide 15. Matthew 10, 28. Do not fear those. This is Jesus. This isn't Pastor Chris. I'm just the the messenger. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. I'm preaching through the gospel of Mark. There have been plenty of sermons about God healing people, God loving people, and We're just up to the point where he's correcting people. He's warning people. This isn't my card for who I am. It's just who God is and what he's saying for today. Next week, I'll be a little further down. See what God has to say, right? But you are hearing the word of God being preached to you in God's order. Because he's the author of the New Testament. He, he, spoke, he spoke through men. So the chief priests, scribes, and elders of Israel do what they could in this instance to protect themselves. Well, they didn't really do what they could. They, they did what was best for them in their minds. Doing what they could that was best for them truly would be to repent and believe, right? They didn't answer Jesus' questions and they got out of Dodge. If you fear the Lord, what should you do? Well, whatever the Lord says. <laughs> and appreciate what he has done for you. Fall in love with him. Give your life to him. Examine yourselves daily to see if you're in the faith. Anything that, that you see that's hindering you. We were, I was watching, Nancy and I were watching Blue Bloods last night. And they were around the dinner table and... Uh, and what they were doing, they do it once a month, I think. And they, the question that goes around the table is, what did you fail at this week? And they had to say something they failed at and what they did to change it. Right? And look, we all came to faith in Christ. So kudos, right? But what's in, you know, am I examining myself constantly to see you know, the Lord is really, he's, he's really telling me, I got I to gotta let go of this, or I got to do this, I got to, you know, 
yeah, these are works, but if you're going to do a work that's going to bring you closer to the Lord, shouldn't you want to do it, right? So we repent. We, our life is a turning to God and a walking closer to him and away from other things, forsaking sin. Instead of finding a place of repentance, however, the type of person that we're seeing in the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, they only resent, reject, hate, and then evade. They escape, thinking they're escaping the Son of God. Now, in this set of scriptures today from Mark 12, Jesus quoted Isaiah twice. Isaiah 5 and Isaiah 8. Once at the beginning, once at the end of these verses. And it's a deliberate appeal by Jesus to these people, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Those who are plotting his death to understand the ultimate seriousness of what they were doing. They had rejected John the Baptist, who was authorized by God. They also would reject the Christ, also authorized by God, to Israel's immediate peril. The decisive catastrophic, catastrophic judgment in 70 AD on Israel. In the sacking of Jerusalem and the dispersal of the Jewish people worldwide out of their homeland. And their being removed from the root of God to see the Gentiles grafted in by their faith in Messiah. The same faith they rejected. In rejecting the Christ, you allow him to be crucified, not for your salvation, but for your judgment. Our decision makes a, a, a difference, doesn't it? We have a choice. He came to live and to die for the purpose of seeking and saving the lost. And if for all that, you end up in hell for your unbelief, what a shame. What a waste. Now look, the immediate context of today's verses were, were the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders, but, you know, it is a warning to all of us indeed, you know. Um, yeah, we're his, but we're, we're called closer to him. And if you're not his, you're called to him. And you're, you will either receive him or reject him. You will make a decision. But no decision is a decision. I pray that we all see each other in eternity. Amen. In an eternal life. Hallelujah. Worship team.